first technical session of uh, day three. Uh, many of you are at the previous uh, Q and A uh, session. And, uh, thank you for all the the feedback and comments in there. That's what brings a lot of value. Is uh, uh, sessions is uh, participation and uh, giving everybody something to take away with. So thank you again for participating uh, in that um, part of the program. Um, I'm uh, Neil Bracken, the president of Radio Metrics, an advanced radar company. We're one in the same. To just corporate depth check there. And what I want to talk about today is the microwave radiometer, um, an instrument that has been around for a long time. It was the origination of uh, the company Radio Metrics, but really underappreciated, underutilized instrument that, from our perspective, uh, and what we're seeing in the market is really coming into its own and getting a lot of more visibility. Uh, for a very good reason, and I'll talk about that today. So uh, we are an instrument manufacturer in uh, Frederick, Colorado, just outside Denver. Um, the uh, business uh, radiometric side, again, was formed out of the UCAR Foundation, as well as our sister company, Advanced Radar Company. Uh, also, a technology transfer out of the uh, UCAR and CAR Foundation which is the National Center for Atmospheric Research in, in Boulder, Colorado. So you know, we have research and we have education and academia in our, in our DNA. Um, we're fortunate still to have uh, the founder of ARC, Rula Frontis, as uh, a lead member of our team. Uh, and uh, many of the original folks from Radiometrics are also still involved uh, in the organization, which you know, helps us bring science and uh, education capacity building into, uh, into our business. Uh, we're a system integrator, but we do manufacture <coughs> the radiometer, excuse me. Uh, we have uh, 12 manufacturing patents uh, around this technology and around this instrument, um, in addition to uh, the, the wind radar and our combined product, which we call Skycast. Uh, but the microwave radiometer uh, has uh, some history which has been challenged, and that is it was a research design instrument uh, and therefore took a lot of tapering uh, and a lot of playing with. Uh, but that's been the past. It's really a, it's a plug and play instrument now. Uh, we used to have to calibrate that instrument once a year, which required the customer to uh, utilize liquid nitrogen to set a, a base temperature and go through all that. That's also in the past. Now we're able to auto calibrate uh, the instrument. So uh, it's deployable uh, and provides really key data, which is becoming more and more valuable uh, as uh, NWP and other models become more and more capable. They're looking for better, more robust data sets, which is exactly what the microwave uh, wave radiometer. Uh, provides. So when you're thinking about EWS implementation operations, forecasting, enhancing your forecasting, your decision support tools, uh, the radiometer is a wonderful fit for that. That's just a quick look of what it looks like. Uh, all these slides again are available uh, out of here and I put some of the technical information on how the radiometer works, its theory of operation in here. That's not going to be part of the uh, presentation here this morning. Uh, we're looking just on the practical application side uh, of the radiometer. Uh, our current version is the MP3000A. This is a passive instrument uh, in that it does not emit a single signal. Uh, it can be set up in one hour and be collecting data for you. So uh, very easy to deploy with one person in the field. Uh, we've got uh, more than 300 of these instruments around the world in all environments, all climates. Uh, we have a couple of instruments on uh, shipboard right now. Uh, we have instruments on oil platforms, and you can see their performance is very robust. From uh, the plains of Mongolia during a winter ice storm, uh, you can see the radome on there is still clear. That instrument is still producing. Uh, continual profiles and continuing data uh, even through those, that challenging environment. Up to 60 degrees C in some conditions, uh, both uh, in the uh, installations we have in Abu Dhabi and um, uh, Kuwait, across India. And what are you getting from there? You know, uh, the instrument is, is cool and again has a research orientation, but you're getting continuous real time 
atmospheric profiles. And the key data in there being temperature and relative humidity. And there's some real importance to that, which I'll show next. Uh, looking ahead, we have a lot of investment in, in this instrument, uh, and we'll be coming out with a pro version in 2025, which takes our auto calibration capability to the next level. Again, looking from the user's perspective on getting a more and more plug and play, get the instrument and forget it and enjoy the data uh, perspective uh, on this instrument. Uh, we have continual software updates, uh, and I'll show a little uh, sketch of uh, a marine and, and buoy application that uh, is also under development. Again, what are you getting with the microwave radiometer? Is you're getting a traditional UT that you see from uh, from the weather balloon. It does not provide wind information. Be, be clear about that. But you do get very accurate. Uh, high resolution temperature and humidity profiles from the surface up to 10 kilometers. And the advantage that we have in other methods of thermodynamic profiling is this is continuous. We like to say you can get the movie instead of the still shot. So you can launch a balloon as many do once a day, maybe twice a day. Um, whereas we can provide this core sample, these key uh, metrics continuously as, as, as often as every two minutes. Um, for use and ingestion into your models and your forecasting tools. Here's just an example of where that can be a benefit. This is an actual um, uh, 24 hour period where if you were looking at a traditional balloon launch at zero and 12Z, you're missing the activity uh, in between there. And, and I think we all know the meteorology background uh, in convective areas in particular between uh, early afternoon and, and late in the evening, yeah, that's where you're having all your convective activity and all your thunderstorms. And if you can have that profile in there every five minutes and putting that into your model, using some of our basic tools, obviously you're forecasting your capabilities and capacity and, and ability to provide decision support uh, to your constituents of your office greatly improves. Uh, in fact, there was a uh, study done uh, on the impact of specific data sets into the European model. And so what is most impactful on improving the relative sensitivity uh, of the model? And you can see at the uh, top of the list here, microwave, radiometer, water vapor, and temperature, of which you get both with the radiometer, you contribute 41% of the improvement in the accuracy and the sensitivity of uh, the European model. So uh, think about how much you can improve your forecasting both locally, regionally, um, or nationally by accessing this continual stream of high resolution atmospheric data. Some other, uh, this is just a comparison again of temperature to start with at the top where you're comparing the radiometer data to the traditional radio sound weather balloon launch. And you can see it's very consistent on there. Um, and we've done a lot of third party validation, side by side comparisons um, so that we can improve our products so that we know we have confidence in the data that you're using, uh, in particular those high value temperature and water vapor metrics. Um, just a few of the tools that can be used uh, out of this. Um, continual monitoring of inversion height and depth. So think of applications in, in aviation for turbulence, uh, air quality in the mining industry. Uh, we have uh, the US uh, military, in particular uh, the Army is a customer of ours. Knowing and monitoring um, inversion layers makes a big difference in ordinance testing. Uh, and maintaining where that sound and sound wave is going to transfer. So when they're able to view and know uh, what they have for an inversion profile continuously, it doesn't work that they get one or two soundings a day. They need to look at this continuously uh, for that plan. So again, the near quality applications, very, very useful. Um, uh, many of the large, well-known uh, cities in the world, such as Delhi, Mexico City, uh, their groups are using microwave radiometers to improve the air quality and the warnings uh, of air quality for the population. 
icing potential for aviation and increasingly in UAVs or, or the drone market out there. As you know, one of the major challenges with operating UAVs is uh, transitioning into super cool water. Uh, there's no PIs and anti-ice capabilities as of yet, and certainly the, the smaller, more agile uh, drone and UAVs, uh, that's not in the, in the near term as a solution. So if you can forecast that, and not just do it broadly saying there's critical icing conditions this afternoon. You know, we can get it down to minutes of when you're going to see super cool water vapor at a specific altitude so that you can avoid that flight plan around that uh, in the UAV and, and drone market. In comparing the real advantage here, which is continuous 24 7, 365, temporal <coughs> measurements. Uh, of the atmosphere versus a balloon launch again in the uh, not just getting a balloon launch once or twice a day but um, capacity and sustainability for those of you in, in the hydro net world um, as operators training making sure that you have all the consumables for managing and operating uh, your your balloon and your radio song uh, deployment uh, we're not saying we're a replacement for that, but we're certainly an enhancement um, where you can um, balance one radio sound a day, but then have a continual profiler uh, next and coincide with that in your company, your city, in your region. There's uh, some companies using drones, and the limits around that um, are wind. Uh, there's limits on the maximum wind that can be reported. There's also all sorts of operational challenges with getting those profiles from a UAV or drone right now. Uh, and then it's the boundary layer. So um, all of the modelers out there and the use of models, the most critical information is in those lower two to three kilometers of the atmosphere. That's where all the water vapor is. That's where all the uh, temporal uh, temperature changes are. That's where all the weather is. And as wonderful as all the satellites are that are being deployed out there, uh, <laughs> they still can't see through that bottom um, two to three kilometers. And so for those of us in remote sensing on the ground looking up, this is where you get the highest value data is from instruments like the microwave radiometer. And at the very least, it's a great enhancement calibration tool for many of these uh, uh, instruments, uh, satellite-based instruments. On the R&D side, we are uh, moving forward and look to expect in 2025 a buoy mounted uh, or shipboard uh, radiometer. As we all uh, in here have seen uh, these global data deserts and we're looking across Africa and all the open territory, we're looking for remote sensing instruments. Hey, radiometer is a great solution in there, but what about the ocean? And getting on uh, an instrument like the radiometer where we can put this on a mobile platform on many of the shipborne um, cargo operators uh, and cruisers, which we're speaking with on um, deploying our instruments continuously around the world. So we get these profiles and that boundary of information uh, into the models will be a, a great enhancement. Um, fairly quickly wrapping up then a product that we have uh, in turn, as we combine our radiometer with our manufactured wind profiler, radar wind profiler, and we call this SkyCast. And this was designed around the aviation industry, uh, primarily for wind shear detection. This is not an effective wind shear, uh, but we can ingest then uh, weather radar data for convective wind shear. And then you have a combination, you're, you're covering the largest hazard in aviation, which is wind shear detection in the wind. Uh, we've had some real success in deploying this uh, in, in Africa with the second, with uh, five systems uh, deployed currently. And uh, the customers are very pleased with that and, and looking for more opportunities to deploy more SkyCast systems uh, throughout the SECNA network. Uh, in Thailand, uh, we've become the provider of choice for windshield detection with nine airports covered and another six starting uh, in June of this year. Um, we did a pilot project with the U.S. Air Force up in Alaska in challenging environment. A lot of cold, dry air up to get measurements up there to detect wind shear. Uh, but the Air Force is very happy with this, and we're moving forward to deploying uh, 25 to 28 systems uh, throughout the global network of, of the U.S. Air Force. 
starting uh, in late 2024. Uh, and then we have the architecture and the software, again, to not only ingest our data, but other aviation-driven data, so it's the data class, if it's the AWOS, or uh, weather radar data information on the airport to provide a full suite of aviation tools from a meteorology and a, a airport operator perspective. And then we scale that into a countrywide solution for emergency warning systems, the multi-hazard emergency warning systems which we've been talking about at this conference. Um, I spoke about a little bit earlier, both of our businesses came out of the National Center for Atmospheric Research with an educational background and uh, then pushing from uh, internally, uh, we have a initiative on capacity building and education, working closely with our integration partners to show that's part of it. And we just love to show some of the pictures there of, of both teams coming to us in Colorado and us being in the field and making sure that this capacity building training is part of uh, every installation and uh, every opportunity that we have. And I'll sum it up with there. Uh, keep it on time. Uh, again, the, the slides are all available with uh, the Richmond team. I uh, included about five more slides after this that gets into some of the clearing and operation of the Pierce One Summit side on uh, the operation of the microwave radiometer. And I'm here all day to allow some of my colleagues to answer all your questions. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd now like to invite Francisco to the jewel base up to the set. This is Hello, my name is Francisco from Broadways. Yeah, from that's good. So, first of all, please forgive us for uh, English. Uh, it's not our native language, so sometimes it's a little, it's a little bit difficult for us to, to speak in English very well. So, uh, we used to to start our conversation with a sentence that is the uh, environment speaks, and then we do a question. Do we understand what the environment speaks? That's very important because uh, what we have around us every day, every hour is data. And this data needs to be um, translated into information for us to, to understand what is happening every time. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, how much does it cost not to understand the environment? I put some some information about the area of them uh, that is here in South Africa, and do some perimeters of uncertainty in the water level measurements would represent around seven trillion liters of water. That's a lot of water for a country where. Uh, as far as I know, every drop of water matters. Okay. And in Itaipu is the last trip there in Brazil. It's one of the biggest of the world, actually, also one of our clients in Brazil. Uh, two centimeters of uh, uncertainty of the, the water level measurements can represent 27 billion of water. Again, a lot of water. Uh, why did I? Choose two centimeters to do this, this conversation. That is because this is the, the average or the minimum uh, uncertainty that we have in the pressure of water level measurements uh, in the market today. 0.1% to 20 meters, we have two centimeters. 
So knowledge, not having accurate data can cost much more in first lives. And that's what we are facing every day and every week, every month around the world, especially right now in Brazil. Uh, and why do we need to understand the, the environment? But I put some data here for, uh, from South Africa, where we are right now, and also from Brazil. Actually, Brazil is a very interesting place when we look between Brazil and South Africa, or Africa in general, because Brazil is very deep. And we have all kinds of environments in Brazil. Since both dry areas or wet areas with a lot of water, like we here have in Africa, for example, in the last year, this some data from the African Weather Services, uh, 170 millimeters of rain, total rain, in total with the degree of Brazil, almost half of what is the normal for the region. So we have a very serious drought here, into here. But we also have, uh, sorry, we also had the same situation in Brazil two years ago, or last, sorry, last year. So, this is very challenging when you every drop of water that you have available is important. And we need to understand what is happening. We need to understand that not measuring, measuring itself is not enough. We need to understand and to measure its accuracy and have the robust equipment. We have the equipment that would bring you a very reliable data and accurate data. This is why we think about working with this. The manufacturer equipment that puts in this reliable data. So, water is an extremely powerful resource. Well, how to manage it? We, we cannot control the water, but we can measure, understand, and make decisions about how can I manage what is happening. Natural disasters affect the vehicle we are facing right now. Uh, water users, drought effects, uh, sustainable infrastructure development. Like even uh, for the infrastructure of the city, but also for the infrastructure that we need to, to monitor the, the weather. Uh, ecosystem preservation. But, you know, I, I only will have a uh, good decision. Well, I will only make good decisions if I have good information to make these decisions. If I have bad information, the decisions cannot be, be very good. So, in the early world systems, for example, in October 2023 in Brazil, in the Amazon, you think you all know about the, the, the forest there in Brazil, we had this so severe drought. Probably the, the worst uh, event that we had of this kind in Brazil in the last years. And right now, day 24, last week, actually this week, is still happening, we had one of the worst uh, floods in, the, in Brazil in Brazil history. But this is a very emotional image for us because this is happening very near from our homes and actually very near from where we live. We have a lot of family and friends there. Uh, the company brought his vehicle to there to help the people, everything else. All of these regions in red here is underwater right now. And what happened? Actually, we had a very warning system. This information was where. Was generated and was published. But maybe some of the people who didn't get this information correctly, maybe some of the people didn't know what, what to do with this information. And maybe many alerts were emitted in the past. So there is there will be a thought, there will be a thought, but nothing happened. And the people simply, oh, it's just an alert. It happens every time. But this is what the reality is right now. And even if we have the, the early alert system and we have the, the equipment there, when this happens, most of the equipment stop working. So the people right now that are away working there to mitigate the problem, they don't have the equipment because they stop working. They are up from the water sometimes or they are not working and they don't have mobile equipment to do the job. So they, this is something that we need to think about. I need the information before the event, I need the information during the event to mitigate the problem, I need the information after the event. So we can move on, we can go on. And uh, this is what happened in Brazil. We have here these weather stations in this region, 
and most of them are not working anymore. And also for the sustainability of the systems, because uh, as was already mentioned here, some of those systems were installed four years ago, and they are not working anymore. That's why we started with the global systems. We think that uh, uh, everybody has a mission. And uh, for some people, the mission is to, to manage. For some people, the mission is to be a politician, bring the, the, the politics for this. But for us, it's to bring the technology and to provide the technology to do your job. So we need very accurate and robust equipment. We, we have uh, uh, bad data like zero rain. Zero rain is not breaking, it's perfectly fine. But after some months, some weeks, or some months of some disaster, I will discover that it actually rained. But the, my rain gauge was blocked, or my water level sensor was damaged, or it moved with the water. So in some places, we don't. The uh, equipment is installed, installed so far away that we cannot do the maintenance properly. We cannot get there uh, to make the maintenance. This rain gauge here uh, was installed in some places that we needed to go there, there by helicopter. But this place is very strategic for, for getting the events in this area. So we needed the uh, equipment there, but we need to do the maintenance. It's not very easy to do. So the solution for this, actually what we do, is the smart sensors. It's a sensor that has a, the ability to, to give you not only the data, but also some other variables about the quality of the data. It has a self-diagnostic, so you just say, oh, the sensor is okay, or the sensor, there's something strange with the sensors. If the rain gauge, for example, you will say, for you, that if the rain gauge is clogged, but if this is on level, but it's vibrating, the water, the water level of radar, for example, if there is a big bird that lands in the sensor and uh, and the sensor is moved, you will know about that. And this is the information that we need to assess the quality of the data. So if I have good data, I know about the quality of the data, I'm able to, to make the proper decisions. Well, I can... I yeah, stay here and talk for hours, but we only have 10 minutes, and you right now 30 seconds. Thank you. So, <laughs> this is some, of some of our equipment are already installed around the world. So, this is in Brazil, a very dry area in Brazil. Here is here in Africa, actually. Here is in Antarctica, some of our clients. And this is what we do. It means very robust and reliable systems to help you to. Yeah, the, 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 the this is our team in Brazil. My contact with the leader team, our distributor contact here in South Africa, the leader team also. You are totally good for the contact team or we are at the service right now. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francisco. Now we have our final um, technical presentation of the event, which is Johnny from Bobsonic. Yeah, it's working. Thank you. So we try to make this in 10 minutes. Uh, I'm very delighted to introduce you Sonic. Sonic is a French company specializing in manufacturing, uh, metallurgical and hydrological stations. And my name is Johnny from Kenzan, and I'm the sales manager at Blue Sonic. Um, Uh, with over 40 years of experience in uh, meteorology and hydrology, we've been established in 1984 
uh, we are the main supplier of weather stations to Metro France, uh, with uh, stations all over the French territories, uh, which include also uh, La Réunion, uh, La Martinique, uh, La Guyane, of course. Uh, and uh, so that, that's why we, uh, sorry, uh, we meticulously also follow the WMO recommendation and we are ISO certified for 1901. <coughs> and, uh, we are dynamic, agile, and customer oriented company, and we have a, right, a wide range of equipment for meteorology and hydrology. Uh, we will look at the meteorology for observation solutions. So the, um, we have the CIA automatic weather station. This is the one that is used by Metro France. Um, we can use the Pulsia weather station for synoptic observation, which can include also um, an observer desktop with a local um, connection. So the local observer can look at the data, uh, add manual data, for example, uh, cloud aid or visibility, before coding the message, sign of messages, buffer messages. Uh, we have also solution for uh, climatology uh, observation, for agrometeorology, and also for rainfall. Um, now we look at the data loader that is included in the Pulsia station. It's the P4100. This is also the one that is used by Meteorfront. So this data loader is fully automatic and can measure up to 20. Uh, more than 20 parameters. Uh, we can record more than 500 days of data. And so we can store also data on the USB card in case of uh, problem of communication. Uh, regarding communication, we can communicate data with the 2G, 3G, 4G. We can use also uh, fiber optic or Wi Fi. We can use also satellites. Uh, so the UMATSAT or uh, Iridium, and even uh, now the new constellation can be used also. And we can send the data to at least seven uh, separate servers. So you can have backup servers, you can send uh, the, the data to the National Meteorological Agency, but also to the Hydrological Agency. So the, the, the station can share the data to all of the servers. And uh, this is ready made to be uh, installed in the Arch environment because we include on the data loader uh, waterproof connectors. So even if there is humidity inside the, the cabinet, uh, it would be okay for the for the loader. Uh, the cabinet is made in iron cast, so it's not plastic, so it will be very resistant for against UV um, and, uh, and temperature also. For example, Metro France used this kind of cabinet since 2005, and they're still using the same cabinet. So they just clean it and then they keep it turned back to, to, to white. Uh, what really makes us different uh, is that all cables are protected in the structure because you don't want to have cable outside because of uh, both and uh, damage the cable or even the animals. Um, the equipment is ready made to uh, withstand the world environments, ready made for tropical areas. It's very quick to install. Uh, you can put uh, four uh, synoptic weather stations in one pickup truck, so you don't have to do any installation to come back to the storage and, uh, and drive to the other installation. Sometimes it can take very long. It's very compact design. Uh, it's also fully pre programmed, so you don't need any programming skills to use the data loader because it's already included inside. And very low energy consumption. The solar panel is less than a, uh, a paper sheet of the A4, A5, A5 paper sheet size. So it's very small, also, and the solar panel is integrated into the cabinet, so you cannot uh, take the, the solar panel. Just a quick view of our ideological solutions. So it's the Rivia station. We can include weather level sensor. Uh, we can also add uh, meteorological sensors, for example, or rainbow of temperature, air temperature, air humidity. Um, the, um, 
the, the station can be installed on, on river banks or on bridges. Now about the software solutions. So we have software to access the data uh, remotely, uh, to collect the data, uh, to, to manage the network. So you can make updates uh, remotely. Um, you can also send uh, alert messages to the station so that the station will communicate more frequently. Um, and then you can also look up the data uh, through the graphs, tables, and uh, code all the message, uh, buffer message, or sign up message, or meta message. And of course, data sharing. So we are compatible with many uh, database. Uh, Teamsoft or for example, T data. Uh, the, the, the data can be integrated automatically to this database. Uh, what about the services? So we can we can make installation. We have also partners that can make installations. Uh, we can do the training. It can be a remote training, on-site training, also training in our training uh, in, in our factory. Uh, we can also help you during maintenance process uh, remotely um, by, um, by contacting you just before you were going on site. Or we can do also the maintenance. We will also be able to calibrate the sensors. Uh, and also we can uh, provide data management. Let's say you can use our cloud-based system, which is called Pluxo Web. Uh, so it can be also a, a backup if you want us to back back your uh, your your data. Uh, this, the web station can connect to your server and even back up to our server so that if you in event you have a problem with the server, you can still have your data. So what makes a difference is that we have a complete offer. Uh, the equipment is really made to withstand. Uh, the drug uh, environments, so really tropical areas. Uh, it's very good to install, uh, very low energy. Uh, so the, the solar panel is included in, in the enclosure. And uh, and uh, so just to sum up, Musonex really the robust solution for quality hydro meteorological data delivered on time. And if you have any question, you can tell me come to me at the booth and it would be very happy to give you my brochure in French or in English. <laughs> Thank you very much. Many thanks, Johnny. Really appreciate that. Um, and now, actually, I have a question for everybody here because you have a choice. As we're ahead of time, if you want another break to grab another coffee, you can have 10 minutes or we can go straight into the finance session. So I was going to give a raise hand so I was going to get ideas. Do you prefer a 10-minute break? Okay. Do you prefer the break the financing? Oh, okay, okay, okay. right. Give me one second. If you want to go grab a coffee, then do it now, then. <laughs> right, let me get that ready first.